I'm excited to be here. Side note, be praying for me. I'm going to Australia tomorrow for a week. I'm praying I find good coffee. I was telling a friend this recently, a few days ago, and she's like, are you going home to visit family? I was like, we're still, we still on this. All these years later, I'm not Australian. And I, it was a moment of like discouragement. And I was like, I'm not Australian. She's like, that's right, you're from New Zealand. And I'm like, that's even <laughs> that. So please make a note. Dylan is South African. Spread the word. Help me out because I don't know how much more of this I can take. Um, I might need a shirt that says I'm South African. I'm kidding because I know how that works. Someone walks up to you with a shirt that says that I will not wear the shirt if you gave me that. It was a joke. Um, welcome to church. Um, I'm glad that you're here this afternoon. I believe God has something special in store for you. I don't believe that anyone in this room is here by coincidence. I think through each one of your stories, how you ended up here, how even God made you at such a specific time, you found a community, someone invited you, and somehow we all ended up together in this room in 2024. That's not a mistake. God brought you here this morning, and I believe you're here with a purpose, um, and that presence and the experience that you are feeling during worship is not just energy. It's the Holy Spirit, which promises joy and peace beyond your experience. Um, so I pray that you would encounter God this morning. I have a word that I believe is from the Lord. I want to start out with reading 1 John chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, right towards the end of your Bible. If you hit Revelation, you went too far. So 1 John chapter 3, this is John writing. He's about 70 to 80 years old. It's been about, no, he's about 100 years old. It's been about 70 years since Jesus passed away. And it's one of his last writings summarizing the gospel to you and I. And I believe it's profound for us in our time right now. So it's 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is what John writes. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Pause. That already is a really great start to the verse. Why? Because we live in a time where everyone is trying to define love. Culture is trying to define love. Culture has tried to make their version of love into a God. Love is not God. God defines love. Can I get an amen? Because we have people preaching what love is based on their preference, based on what they think is the most loving. But what you think is loving changes from day to day. So your version of love does not define who God is, but God should define how we see love. What do I mean by that? People are like, hey, you corrected that person. That's unloving. Well, okay, then we have to look at Jesus. Did Jesus correct people? Yes. And he's perfect Love, so that means correction is loving. If you're never correcting, you have to ask yourself the question, is, are you actually walking in love? The answer is no, because perfect love corrected. So we have to ask these questions because culture is trying to define love. But what defines love? Love is defined by the cross. That's what John goes on to say in that verse, because he laid down his life for us. The only reason you and I actually know what love is is because of the cross. If the cross didn't happen, you don't know what love is, and neither do I. The definition of love for you and I, the cross. Jesus is the definition of love. So that's where John starts. So our pursuit of love has to be a biblical pursuit, starting with the life of Jesus. Then he goes on to say, if that wasn't enough, now he's going to move to mission for you and I. So that was information or revelation, now it's mission. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So he starts off by saying, this is what true love is. That's challenging enough that love is to lay down your life. And he goes, you should do the same thing for those around you. That's an invitation for the rest of our lives. Amen. I'm not there yet, but that's where we're moving. Verse 17. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Question mark. What is he saying here? He's saying, how do you know if the love of God abides in somebody by how they care and give to others? Yeah. Quite a profound verse. Like, there is metrics to whether I abide in God's love. One of them is, am I giving? Are you seeing that in the scripture? If you close up your heart, how can God's love abide in you? That means if I'm not sacrificially giving and caring for others, I am not abiding in God's love. Okay, it's quiet, which is fine. It gets better. Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So 
God didn't just proclaim from heaven, I love you. It wasn't just words. See, words are plentiful in our time. A lot of words happening. A lot of people saying things. Love is not just in word, but in deed. It actually requires action. If it doesn't have action, it's not love. God so loved the world that He gave. Our actions are what is loving. Let's pray, and then we're going to go on a journey together. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you would come down and show us love. Not just say it, but you revealed love to us. That while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, you chose to come and die for us. Lord, we remind ourselves this morning how loved we are, that we get to love because you first loved us. Jesus, we love you so much. Holy Spirit, I ask that this afternoon you would reveal Jesus to us more clearly, that you would remind us of what he taught and you would show us his teachings through the scriptures. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you, God has ever spoken to you and told you to do something that was above your pay grade? You weren't prepared for it. You weren't ready for it. It made you very uncomfortable. Have you been there before? Yeah. I've realized the more I'm led by the Lord, it leads me to uncomfortable places. Modern Christianity is like, God will lead you to success and comfort. Well, why would he give you a comforter if you're always going to live in comfort? The Holy Spirit's called the comforter in Scripture, which would imply God will lead you out of your comfort zone to be in need of him. Are you tracking with me? So every time I'm like, God, lead me, it's normally not to my comfort zone. It's normally out of my comfort zone. We have a view of obedience, which is not what the early church or the, the disciples had. Because our idea is like, if God leads me and I'm obedient, it's to comfort and worldly success. The disciples, 11 out of the 12, led to their death. Okay. Are you tracking with what I'm saying? So there's this idea, so I remember one time I was in Bible school, this happened a few times actually, I'm driving to church one day, excited to go and worship, and I see a guy riding a skateboard, a homeless guy on the side of the road, and, and I feel God say, stop that man. And I'm like, it's kind of awkward, he's on a skateboard, like anything else you want me to say to me, he's like, just stop him and I'll share the rest, which is often how God is, right? Like, just trust me. It's like, no, that's not what I want to do. Like, I want to know everything. It's easier that way. He's like, stop that man. I'm like, hey bro, he stops. I'm like, what now God? He's like, Invite him to church. I'm like, bro, Jesus loves you so much. Do you want to come to church? Partially hoping he says no because it's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm like, I'll be obedient. He'll say no, but I was still obedient. He's like, bro, I'd actually love to come to church. I'm like, okay, bro, get in the car, put the skateboard in the trunk. He put it like the, the like sandpaper side down. I'm like, oh, that's going to ruin the back seat. But get in the car. <laughs> then I'm like, this is going to be awkward. Then my boy starts talking. And I mean, he's talking. I didn't even get a word or no introductions. He's talking, telling me his life story. Now that I'm okay with because then I don't have to talk. Like, I'm actually okay with that. Like, you talk, you do your thing. Because it's like 10 minutes to church. That's fine if you're talking. You aren't going to be at home with me. You aren't going to be involved in my life. You talk right now and then I won't see you again because I'm just taking you to church. So take him to church. Church is done. He's talking most of the service over the guy who's preaching, correcting some of the stuff that the guy who's preaching because he was raised a Christian. And I'm like, kind of like, people are looking at me. I'm like, I just picked him up. Like, he's not with me. Like, he's just, God told me. You know, like, be like victims of God's voice. Like, God told me. Like, I, people are always like, God said, I didn't want to do it. I'm like, that must be hard being obedient. But I'm like, okay. So we go to, and then I'm like, okay, bro, have a good night. And then God's like, let him stay on your couch. I'm like, oh boy. I'm like, God, I think you forgot. Me, I like my own space. I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't like, I love people, but I like recharging alone. And God, this guy talks like a lot. So I show up at home that night to my roommate's surprise. I'm like, guys, I, I have a surprise. They're like, what is it? I'm like, this is my new, this is our new roommate. And they're like, wait, what? I'm like, hey, he's going to be staying on our couch for a few days. They're like, how do you know him? I'm like, we just met, like, he's a great dude, like, and then now my boy starts, like, talking, and I mean this guy can talk, and I went on this journey of, there was a few other people, one guy that I'd stay on the couch, different guy, never talked, he would sit like this, not talk, I'm like, hey, bro, what's going on? One day, I come out of the shower, 
my boy could talk. He's swearing at me. I've never heard so many swear words. And he's like screaming at me. I'm like, bro, you talk? And, and I'm like drying myself. I come out eventually. He had to go because he started screaming at neighbors on the porch, which isn't a great look. Like he would never talk unless he was manifesting a demon. So the demons had a lot to say. He didn't have so much to say. He didn't want to get free in the end. So we had to ask him to leave. It was a whole thing. Then another guy rolls up. Now we got two on the couch. I thought the first guy could talk. The second guy could talk. Like, I would put in headphones to watch a movie. I would finish the movie, take out the headphones, still talking. Whether you listened or not didn't matter. My boy was going to talk. I would set up my friends. I'd invite them over and be like, bro, have you told Sebastian your life story? And I'd be like, Sebastian, I'm teaching you how to say no. Because this guy would talk for hours. One day he got stuck in the door when I was going to bed. I lay in bed for two hours listening to him, trying to fall asleep. And you, you can't even get a word in. He's sharing it. But the first guy that jumped on the couch, he would, he, he's like, bro, I get money from the government every month, but can you help me out this month? I'm 21 at the time. I'm like, yeah, bro, I can help you out. I'm going to be loved to this guy. I'm going to love him. He's going through a tough time. He's like, I get 800 bucks from the government every month. I'm like, bro, that's amazing. I got you this month. So we're walking through Trader Joe's. He was eating good. I was going to TJ's with him. I'm like, Trader Joe's, what do you want? He's like, can I get this? I'm like, no, that's not in our budget for this month. Um, we keep going. I pay for everything for him. A month later, he gets his check. I cash check. I give it to him. He comes back two days. He's like, hey, bro, do you have some money for me? I'm like, bro, I, we just cashed your check. He's like, I know, bro. Somebody stole it from me. I'm like, bro, that sucks. Your luck's just so bad. Okay, I'm going to give you money again. After six months or so, this is still happening. Every month, the poor guy is losing his check. And I'm still naive enough to believe this. I'm like, bro, that sucks so bad that you're losing your money. Like, I'm going to give you money again. I'm going to give it again. I'm like, bro, how does everybody pick on this guy? Like, this is so annoying. <laughs> Later on, I found out he had a meth addiction. It wasn't, he, he wasn't losing the, the money. But there I was, naive. So, um... Eventually, I'm sitting with him, and he opens up for the first time in 20 years that he's struggling with a meth addiction. And that day, when he opens up and brings it into the light, he confesses his sin to a few other believers. He says he feels a hand go into his chest and pull a dark cloud out of him, and he gets set free from meth that day. And I'm still in contact with him almost 10 years later, gets set free from meth, but that's where the power of confession is, number one, and bringing things into the light. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another, why? So that you may be healed. There's healing available for you in vulnerability. So shares it. And then I start asking him questions. I'm like, hey, why, how did you end up on my couch? And he starts saying like, I'm like, what got you to here? And he's like, I actually had a nine to five job. I have an amazing wife. We were married for over 10 years. And one day I came home after 10 years. We were trying for a child. My wife finally got pregnant. And he said, when the day came of her birth, of the child's birth, I was so excited, and I went into the hospital to see my newborn child. As it was coming out, it was a mixed baby, but both of us were white. And what I realized that day is I could have looked at a homeless person and gone, how dare you be homeless, but it's really easy to judge from a distance. See, distance creates distortion when proximity creates empathy. See, oftentimes you're really quick to throw stones at people's stories that we don't know because it's safe at a distance to make judgments that might not be accurate. Maybe in this room you have assumptions about people that probably aren't accurate because from a distance there's distortion. If you got close, you'd probably know there's a whole different story. And I'm not saying you have to get close, but I'm also saying drop the prejudice of judging people you don't know. Imagine me going, he deserves to be homeless. I don't know the pain and the trauma of what that man's going through. See, when it comes to this conversation, my sermon title for this afternoon is Love in Motion. Love in Motion. When it looks at becoming love, the way God does that for you and I is through people, through community, through a body of believers is how we go on this journey of becoming love. So when we go into the idea of community, we have to start with Jesus. That's where we're going to start. He is, the, he is the center point of our faith. We look to Him for our view on community. He didn't look down from a distance. He came close. Why? The, the, the Scripture says He can empathize with our weakness. So He didn't just judge from a distance. He came down and He meets us in our weakness. Why? Because then He can empathize with us and He's moved with compassion to help us. Why does He go to the cross? Because He does life with people 
and is moved with compassion to the cross. So when it comes to our faith, the one thing that sets apart Christianity, the Trinity. Most, God, most religions confess that their God is love. Then the question for you that I have is, who were they loving before mankind? They could have only loved themselves. I mean, every other religion has a self-indulged God that just loves itself. The thing that sets apart Christianity is that we have three in one. So before you and I were created, there was a love relationship between the Trinity. And then God makes you and I to invite us in to this love relationship of community that they were already experiencing we get to be invited into. We weren't made because God was in lack. We were made because God wanted a relationship with us. And then Jesus comes down and does it. Even the very fundamentals of the Christian faith called the sacraments require community. Here's what I mean by that. What's step one of a Christian life being preach the gospel and accepting it. That requires somebody preaching the gospel to you. Then what does the Bible say? It says, he who believes and is what is saved? Baptized. How can you be baptized without community? You can't baptize yourself. So someone that's like, I can do life alone without community. How? Then we look at the other sacraments. We look at communion. It's supposed to be taken in community. One body comes broken into many so that the body can become whole again. Another sacrament, marriage. How are you going to marry yourself? The Christian life itself has to be done in community. Now, I get on this topic, there's so many extremes, right? One guy's like, community, community, body, body, body. It's all about the body. I'm like, bro, what about the head? It's not just about the body. We get so fixated. Like that, that's one metaphor. You're also a tree and a bride. You a lot of metaphors. They're like, you aren't complete without me. Okay, so then Jesus was in lack in the desert? No, I'm complete in Christ. Scripturally, I have the Holy Spirit, which is the fullness of God dwelling in me. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, which is the fullness of God. You don't have a portion or percentage. People are like, well, you need the body. I'm like, okay, but let's get specific then, because I agree with it to a certain extent. I don't need the body to be whole in Christ, because I have Him. People are always going to fall short of helping you. They're never going to satisfy you. Yeah, you need it. Okay, well, how many do I need? Is one other person enough? No. Is three enough? No. Is 10 enough? No. Okay. Is 900 enough? Yes, that's the body. Okay, where did you draw the line? How did you find it biblically? Or they're like, I have a piece of Jesus. You have a piece of Jesus. I'm like, okay, so there's three billion pieces of him in different individuals? No, we all have access to the fullness of Christ. And then you have the other guy that's like, I'm doing life alone. I don't need people. I'm never going to be in community. Well, then explain why Jesus did life in community. Explain why he was around people. So what I'm saying is oftentimes people preach one tension or the other tension, but it's actually supposed to be in the middle where it starts in silence and solitude. Henry Nouwen said this, only a man in silence and solitude has something of value to offer community. I'm going to say it again. Only someone in silence and solitude has something of value to offer community. Why do I say that? Because Jesus teaches that in Matthew 6, go into your door, close your room, close the door. I'll reward you where? Openly. So your intimacy with God begins to reward the community because he blesses you and your community becomes transformed. Jesus comes and does life. Can I tell you that he learns things through community? The scripture says... Through his suffering, he learned obedience. You aren't running just from community. You're running from formation. Some people are like, Dylan, no leaders ever get me. No communities. I've been searching. No communities ever get me. Every community is unhealthy. I'm like, someone's probably unhealthy, but look again who it is. Because we think community is like, serve me. Here's my preferences. Where can I find my perfect preferences? Community is not your preferences. Community is a leading of the Holy Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit, He will lead you to community. Because He led Jesus there. You can't even start your your ministry without community. Jesus comes out. He's baptized in community, in front of community, when He starts His ministry. So this idea that we can do life alone, we can't do life alone. We are called to do life in community. Why? You have the fullness of God in you, but God wants to complete a work on the earth which cannot be done by you alone. 
It requires the body to complete what he wants to do on the earth. Because uh, preaching a sermon like this, like, it's like, hey, you can't help every homeless person. But we together as the body can make an impact bigger than ourselves. Are you tracking with me? Let's look at um, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, you can turn there so long. Side note for you, community will transform you. I never said it will transform you for the better, but it will transform you. Because joining a gang will change you. Can I get an amen? If you joined a gang today and I came back a year later, you would be a different person. Community changes. That's why scripture says evil, let's read it, evil company corrupts good habits. It's naive for you to think you aren't being formed by the people you're doing life with. So my point is this, community transforms you, but godly community transforms you into the image of Christ. People preach the table in households a lot. Being on a table won't change your life. Being on a table in the presence of Jesus changes your life. Community, eating bread and wine doesn't change your life. Remembering Jesus while you do it transforms your life. The early church said three things will transform you. Contemplative prayer hardships and sufferings that we go through, and thirdly, friendships. The people you do life with on a daily basis are forming you. So I would encourage you to look at your friend group. Jesus had very clear friend groups. He had the 1, 3, 12, 82, and then he goes into hundreds. He had circles. People are like, Dylan, what's your view on clicks? People are clicky. I'm like, okay, what's a click? They're like, well, we need your life together with a couple people all the time. I'm like, well, would like 13 count? They're like, yes, 13 would count. I'm like, okay, so Jesus had a click. <laughs> Some of you are taking a while. Right? Like he did life with the, the, the Last Supper. This would offend me. The Last Supper, I wouldn't have gotten an invite to. He wouldn't have either. It was the 13 of them. But then the difference is we pick an extreme. Here's my 12. I'm only doing life with my 12. Jesus never picked that extreme because then he's like, what is he doing at Zacchaeus' house? He's not one of the 12. See, but we like the extremes. The one guy's only friends with Zacchaeus because then he can never die to himself and grow as a believer. Right? Bro, Zacchaeus says, I love Zacchaeus. Yeah, because Zacchaeus loves you to stay in your old man. And then the other guy's like, bro, I never go around Zacchaeus. That's unholy. I'm like, you don't have to pick an extreme. You do both. Are you with me? Okay. Because I hear so much teaching around this concept of community and family, and most of it is just preference and tradition. That's why I'm like, the scripture doesn't say a whole lot, but they live out a whole lot. Let's just look at that. Because people are like, Dylan, community is an open door policy. I'm like, I've never read that scripture. Maybe in the message it says that, but I've never seen that verse. That could be your preference, but don't put your preference on me. Are you tracking with me? Even James 1.27, Jesus says, I mean, Paul says this, pure and undefiled religion before God and man is to remain unspotted from the world, which means you can become spotted by the world, number one. Number two, and caring for widows and orphans in their time of need. Widows and orphans were the greatest outcasts in society. So what is he saying? Pure, our religion is defiled the moment it is not bigger than ourselves. The moment our religion stops, because our, our generation and this time on earth, everything is catered to self. Individualism is running rampant in our generation. You wake up in the morning, every ad on your phone is catered to you. You open Netflix, every show is catered to you. You walk into a restaurant, every order is catered to you. So suddenly we walk in here and go, hey, what can you do for me? You look at Jesus, look at the community. What is God's only message? Jesus. What does Jesus say? Everything I do is to glorify the Father. Then Jesus is leaving, he goes, hey guys, the Holy Spirit is going to come and teach you what? About me. So it's like the Spider-Man meme. They're all pointing to each other. There's no, hey, have you heard about how amazing I am? So biblical community is pointing to how amazing everyone else is. Yes. This is true community, but we come in going, hey guys, me. 
Individualism doesn't work in Christianity. Because it's not modeled by Jesus. Let's look at Philippians 2. Some of you have been faithfully waiting there. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's a strong verse. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Paul is hinting at what I just said, what Jesus modeled. So you can know who you are, but esteem everyone better than you. Imagine you came in, you were like, these people are all amazing. Instead of like, hey, what about me? See, community will cause you to die to yourself. Often we leave when, when, when it gets hard. See, the idea of community is this. You don't one day, you don't build community, you receive the gift of community. Here's what I mean. You show up with an open heart and you be vulnerable at a cost and you learn to die to yourself and it's a gift that you receive. People are like, Dylan, I don't really want to do life group. It's too uncomfortable. That's kind of the point. The point is that we're a little bit too comfortable in our small niche circles and Zacchaeus never gets reached because we love our small niche circles so much. What if you got uncomfortable and died to yourself a little bit? What if somebody rubbed you the wrong way and you became loved? Can I tell you, those homeless guys on my couch, after being lied to for months, I wasn't like, how dare you lie to me? I'm understanding they are only doing this because they're broken individuals. If they knew who they were, they wouldn't be lying to me. But the reality is, if somebody hurts you, it's because they didn't know who they were. But if you hurt by it, it's because you didn't know who you were. Does that make sense? If somebody hurts you, the idea is like, if they knew who they were, they would never act like that. You've been hurt by people, I empathize with you. But what if your perspective was like, man, that really sucks that someone's so broken they would do that. Because Jesus never hurt because of someone, he hurt four people. He hurt, his heart broke for them. Instead of going, how dare you? These people on the couch, they're lying to me, but I'm dying to them. They're talking to me, but I'm dying to myself. Because Dylan needs to die so Christ can live. So they're lying to me. I'm like, the temptation, turn love off. But then I remember the cross. You're like, Dylan, they don't deserve it. I mean, I didn't deserve it. Like, where's the line? Well, for me, I knew I was sinning for years and kept doing it. God didn't turn his back on me. So, and he's my model for love. Suddenly, I go back to Bible school, and the person that used to jump up and down and kind of annoy me doesn't annoy me anymore. Why? I got someone lying to me every day. (laughs) You can sing off tune. You can do your thing. I got someone at home lying to me, talking my ear off. You are a blessing to me. (laughs) I would be your friend now. What is the idea? That's obviously a low-level example, but I'm dying to myself. There's a reason Jesus didn't kick Judas out of the friend group. Jesus knows, but Judas stays. Even in the Last Supper, hey, here's my body. Here's my grape juice. This is for you. No, you're going to betray me? Well, here's love. That's convicting. No, you don't deserve that. He'll never learn his lesson. Because that's the tension, right? Because the issue is, We look at somebody homeless, and again, distance creates distortion. So I go, I'm not going to help them. If they want to figure out their life, they would figure it out. I'm not going to give any handouts. Salvation was a handout. Salvation was a handout. You didn't earn salvation. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're like, no, they have to earn my help. Oh, you earn God's help. Because this has to define what love is. Are you tracking with me? This has to define. I know I'm challenging me too. I see somebody on the road. What if I was like, man, that breaks my heart that they would be living like that. Let me help you. Because now that guy on the couch, I don't see a homeless guy anymore. needs to figure out. I see a man with deep pain that is broken. That's why he's living that way. So I want to help him because I'm moved with compassion because I'm in proximity to him. So we need to get in proximity with people again because Jesus got close, experienced compassion, and was moved with compassion. 
It's hard to be moved with compassion when you keep everyone at a distance. The journey is becoming love. Jesus is lying on the cross, dying, not for the repentant, but for the one stoning him. So to the question of they don't deserve it. Well, he defines love. He doesn't go, guys, I'm getting off. When you apologize, I'll die. Otherwise, they'll never learn their lesson. They'll never, if I just give to him, he'll never learn his lesson. If I just help them, they'll never learn their lesson. If I just love them, I need to cut off love so they can learn their lesson. I sure am glad Jesus didn't do that to me. I sure am glad that he died for me while I was stoning him. It says I was an enemy of God. The very people stoning him, he's giving up his life for. And I'm not saying you have to be a punching bag. Obviously, you can add boundaries, relationships. But what I am saying is we never have the right to not love someone. And if we can see God's heart posture, how he sees them in their brokenness, it'll be much easier to not judge them. Are you tracking with me? Let's look, let's keep reading Philippians 2. We didn't get very far with that. Verse 4, let each one of you not only look out for his own interest, but for the interest of others. You see, individualism says when you are doing good, you are doing good. When I am doing good, I am doing good. Biblical Christianity says when we are doing good, you are doing good. When we are doing good, I am doing good. We are one body together. So it's not just me coming in looking out for my interests, but for others. It's bigger than myself. My Christianity becomes bigger than myself. See, this is not just about me. Otherwise, we fall into a self-indulged Christianity where God just serves you. Like some of us, the last time we were believing for healing was when a family member was sick. Because we aren't thinking bigger than ourselves that there's sick people in this community. See, people I'm leading, when they aren't walking in wholeness, I take that responsibility on myself to believe and partner with them. We are one body. Some of you, the last time you were believing for finances was when your family was in trouble. There's other people in here that need a miracle financially. They need your faith. See, this challenges our generation where you deserve what you earn. See, the thing about community is we can take some of the preference out, look at scripturally. It's challenging enough when you look at the scriptures. Acts chapter 2 will challenge you. It challenges me. This is what it says. No one was in lack because they sold everything and everything was in common. No one was in lack. They sold everything and everyone in common. That's, I don't have a lot more than that, but let's try to get there. Right? Like that, that kills individualism. Oh, they don't deserve it. I'm going to give it to other people. Everything was in common. See, we aren't doing, you aren't doing good until we are doing good. One body. This Christian walk is bigger than just me. The joy of Christianity is that we formed into the image of Christ through community. God will use community to form you into the image of love. Would you allow him to do it? Show up to life group. Allow him to form you. Show up to community. Allow him to form you. I leave community sometimes saying, I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed. But now I go to God and say, God, kill that in me. It's not the community's issue. Why do I have so many buttons? Why do I find it so hard to love? So I don't go, I need a new community. I don't need a new me. I need people around me sometimes. I'm like, man, you really... But why am I so frustrated, God? Help me to give of myself. Help me to love my neighbor. So I want to challenge you, would you start showing up? Just receive community. It's a gift. You don't achieve it or build it. Receive it. We've already put things in place. Show up to life group. Open your heart. Receive the gift. It's risky too because what if you get rejected? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we're afraid to be ourselves because what if somebody rejects me? Why does rejection scare you so much? 
you go to the secret place. God, why am I so afraid? What if they did reject me? You love me. See, these are the questions you want community to ask you. You want to be provoked. Why am I so afraid of rejection? Maybe because my dad rejected me. Okay, God, heal me. When you run from community, you're running from formation. If God used community for Jesus, He'll use it for you. As we come to an end, I want to, I want to read this quote. The church is not an institution forcing us to follow rules, but a community inviting us to still our hunger and thirst at its table. This is not just a set of rules, but rather a community saying, would you join us at the table? And as we join together in the presence of God, He will begin to quench your thirst and hungers that you have. And Jesus will begin to transform your life. I want to close with, with this verse, John chapter 15, verse 13. This is the same John that's writing the passage that we started off with, but many years early, he said, this is my commandment. Jesus is saying this, that you love one another as I have loved you. That is a profound verse. Love looks like Jesus, of giving of ourselves. Love one another as I have loved you. As we go on this journey of community and becoming love and love in motion, I implore us that Jesus would be the standard. That we would read the scriptures and see how he loved, what he did, how he was moved with compassion. There would be people that live at Zacchaeus' house and in deep community that we merge these two. We don't have to go to the extremes. Love one another as I have loved you. Again, you cannot love until you experience His love. One of my favorite authors said, in silence and solitude is where the Spirit begins to lead you to community. You get alone with God, there will come a time He will lead you to community. Because He led Jesus there. You weren't meant to do life alone. Some of you do life only with your immediate family. You need to branch out. Jesus didn't model that. He could have done life with just Joseph, Mary, James. He didn't. So you can't. Biblically, Jesus did not model that. He is our model. He didn't do life with immediate family only. He made it wider than that. And the verse then goes on to say, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. That is the invitation for you and I. That we would begin to lay down our lives for those around us. Can we stand right now? Our Holy Spirit, we love you. The ministry team can come forward. Lord, we thank you for this invitation into community, into becoming love, Lord, that community is your idea, Lord, that we were made to do life in homes and around tables. Lord, we thank you for your presence. I just sense that people in the room that you were hurt by community, that you were rejected. So because of that, you begin to not be a part of community. Can I tell you that God wants to unlock that part of formation again for you? Would you trust again? Would you risk again? I know it's risky because at some point a leader will fall short again. People will never be perfect. But you can't do life without community. So there's people in the room that a leader said something to you that hurt you. People have done things to you that hurt you and you've shied away from community. Some of you are too comfortable. Today I want to implore you to leave your comfort zone again. We can't become love alone. Who are you going to love when you do life alone? Just yourself. Our world is bigger than us. We were made to love in deed and in truth. So as we go into worship, if you have any need, this afternoon, I think it's a beautiful invitation to come forward and receive prayer. It's humbling. I have a need, but man, do I want to open up to somebody else? Yes, that's community. Even the idea of praying for the sick, the scriptures teach, go to the elders, let them anoint you. Even confession, confess your sins to one another, why so that you may be healed. Are you tired of trying to do life alone? Culture says you can do life alone, but biblically you cannot. So as we go into prayer, whatever you have need of this afternoon, whether it's just someone to partner with you or you have to open up your heart or you need a healing, just begin to come forward and receive prayer as we go back into worship.
Thank you for joining Kingdom Movement Online. We hope that this message impacted you deeply. Share it with your friends and family and don't forget to subscribe.